thanks so much for coming here. Uh, my name is Chris Brummer. I'm the C. Boyden Gray Fellow on Global uh, Growth and Finance here over at the Atlantic Council and a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. And uh, we're delighted to have you here over uh, to hear our honored uh, guest, John Fall, speak today. Um, the topic of our conversation and of our discussion will involve uh, the European banking system as well as uh, international regulatory cooperation more generally. And it's a topic of real interest uh, here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we've had the honor of hosting uh, Commissioner Barnier, leading members of the European Parliament, uh, and we're obviously working very diligently uh, to provide more understanding uh, on the ramifications of international regulatory divergence and the benefits of regulatory cooperation in fields as diverse as uh, financial services uh, to other fields. And we're working on a report with Thomson Reuters and the City UK, as well as a uh, groundbreaking TTIP report uh, assessing uh, uh, the benefits of uh, trade cooperation between two of the more most highly developed and sophisticated uh, trading blocks uh, in, the, in the world. Um, with that said, uh, we have uh, not only John Fall here today, but I wanted to make a public service announcement of sorts. Uh, Sven Gentner uh, is going to be replacing Peter Kersens here uh, as the European Council, and I just wanted to identify him for, for you. Uh, he has uh, big shoes to fill. Peter was obviously a very hardworking and uh, extremely close friend to the Atlantic Council and uh, a pivotal player here uh, in Washington. And we're very, very happy that uh, Sven will be filling those shoes and uh, working with us uh, to promote uh, transatlantic uh, financial and regulatory uh, diplomacy. Uh, but with that said, we have our headliner. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Fall, the Director General for the Internal Market and Services at the European Commission. Uh, we're really absolutely de delighted to have him. Uh, Mr. Fall, a fellow law professor, uh, began his extensive career in the European Commission in 1978 and took on his current role as Director General in 2010, where he's charged with providing a regulatory environment, enhancing competitiveness, innovation, and financial stability. Uh, with such heavy responsibilities, and weighty responsibilities. Uh, we're very excited to hear his thoughts on, uh, again, the state of the European banking system and perhaps moves to better coordinate and facilitate uh, transatlantic regulatory cooperation uh, uh, in uh, financial services uh, and in, with regards to competition more, more generally. So uh, thank you again very much to everyone for being here. And at this point, it's my honor to turn the floor and the mic over to Mr. Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be back in Washington. Uh, I did wonder briefly last week what I would find uh, coming here. What I, <laughs> what I found so far was a very long line at the airport, um, but uh, and light traffic which is always a boon, uh, but uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, important issues for this uh, country to sort out, but that is not the subject of my uh, uh, discussion with you today. Uh, it's uh, uh, a pleasure to be here at the Atlantic Council. This is an important moment in the development of uh, transatlantic relations in the financial services sector. We've been through a very difficult time, a bruising five years since the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Uh, and a lot of hard work uh, has been done and is still being done uh, to reform uh, our financial systems and financial regulation uh, in our respective jurisdictions and, and working together to fill the gaps uh, and to create conditions for our economies to get uh, growing again, uh, but this time uh, on a sustainable path. We're now entering the phase, I think, of making a lot of agreements stick and making them work. Uh, we have crafted a lot of new rules internationally in our domestic jurisdictions, uh, and uh, we now have to make sure that they do uh, what they were designed to do, to restore financial stability, prevent the excesses of the past, and get the financial system back uh, to playing its rightful part uh, in serving the rest of the economy. The European Union and the U.S. 
uh, are advocates of high standards for global financial regulation. We work very closely and very well together uh, in the G20, in the Financial Stability Board, uh, in the Basel Committee, and elsewhere. We've come a long way uh, in uh, writing rules. Uh, we've come a long way in implementing uh, the uh, promises that we have made to each other and to the rest of the world, but uh, we are now down to the hard, uh, uh, the hard task of making sure uh, that our jurisdictions have rules that work well together because of the international nature uh, of so many of the firms and so many of the transactions uh, in the financial sphere. Uh, we don't want duplication, we don't want extraterritorial overreach, uh, we don't want to create unwelcome opportunities for regulatory arbitrage, and we certainly don't want practical implementation uh, which thwarts the very purpose for which the rules were uh, put in place in the, uh, 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 at the outset. The interconnectedness of our economies means that we have a responsibility uh, to work uh, consistently uh, together. It's true uh, around the world. Uh, the G20, uh, its very name, shows that the world is certainly not simply uh, the United States and Europe, uh, but I think it is especially the case uh, given our responsibilities for uh, world finance and frankly also uh, for a considerable part of the crisis uh, in which we are still living. Uh, look at the impact of the subprime uh, mortgage crisis in Europe. Uh, look at the effect of the Eurozone's woes on the U.S. financial system. Uh, it's a cliché that when one of us sneezes, the other one catches a cold, uh, but it's a cliché which has never been truer than it is today. So it's time for us to make sure that the rules actually work together, uh, and the best way to do that uh, is to uh, put in place robust legal frameworks in our respective domestic jurisdictions, uh, and then uh, make sure that globally active institutions are not penalized when they are active in both of our jurisdictions. They should not escape or undermine regulation by exploiting contradictions between those systems, and we certainly don't want to give them any reason to move business to more loosely regulated venues, uh, sparking another international race to the bottom. A lot of this comes down to trust, uh, to forging alliances and acting in each other's as well as one's own uh, interest. It's also about being realistic. There is a big difference between claiming jurisdiction over market participants and transactions uh, beyond your borders and actually being able to enforce those rules effectively uh, outside your jurisdiction. Neither we nor, I suggest, the American regulators will ever have enough resources uh, to act as the financial uh, police uh, force of the world. If any Americans need reassurance about the strength and the rigor of the EU's uh, new legal framework in this area, I suggest they look carefully at the extensive reform agenda that we have pushed through uh, over the last five years. Our first priority was to deal with banks' lack of capital and liquidity. Uh, we will apply Basel III rules to all banks in the European Union from the 1st of January 2014, uh, requiring banks uh, to hold more and better capital to absorb losses. We have specific requirements for the biggest banks, uh, uh, which will have to have sufficient liquidity at all times to withstand crisis situations and limit their leverage. I have seen some reports in this country suggesting uh, that uh, uh, large European banks are less well capitalized than their uh, US counterparts. That is simply untrue. Data from impeccable US sources tell us so. The FDIC published a table recently comparing the EU and US globally systemic important banks, GSIBs, and analysis of this table shows that there is no major difference at all uh, between big banks in the EU and those in the US in terms of levels of capital and leverage. Some commentators frankly get it wrong because they make uh, the simple but understandable mistake of forgetting that there are different accounting standards and therefore uh, get the comparisons wrong. This, by the way, is another reason uh, why we urge our American partners to press ahead with the adoption of international accounting standards, IFRS, uh, instead of delaying this process uh, further. So uh, we would say that our banks are in as good a shape as yours 
uh, but that is not necessarily the best shape they could be in. Uh, there is no uh, reason to be complacent. There is still a lot of work to be done. In Europe, we have to fight fragmentation in our single market, uh, and we have to make sure that the banking system is back on solid ground for good, fit for purpose, lending to the real economy. I'm not sure that everyone realizes how complicated the uh, banking union, but how important the banking union project is uh, in the European Union. The European Central Bank is becoming, is about to become, the sole banking supervisor uh, in the euro area. It will take direct supervision res responsibilities for the largest banks and will head or be the center of uh, a, a network system uh, but responsible for it, uh, whereby smaller banks are supervised on a day-to-day -day basis uh, by their local supervisor, but acting for the single supervisory mechanism. We are creating a single resolution mechanism uh, with a single European fund, uh, inspired in part by the effective setup uh, in the US centered on the FDIC. Uh, the uh, single resolution legislation is now before the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers, uh, and we have every reason to hope and expect, I would say, uh, that uh, it will uh, uh, get onto the statute book uh, in the life of this legislature. That means, effectively, that the European Council of Ministers uh, will uh, finish its work by the end of the year, and the European Parliament uh, uh, by next spring when it breaks up and goes off uh, into uh, elections. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, you may have seen in today's Financial Times reference to uh, a legal opinion on various constitutional niceties uh, that need to be sorted out. Uh, they will all be sorted out, uh, and there is no reason why uh, that legislation should not be adopted. The banking union, with the single supervisory and the single resolution mechanisms uh, will uh, go a very long way uh, to uh, breaking the harmful link between sovereigns and banks uh, in Europe, uh, uh, that uh, link which has harmed both sovereigns and banks so much uh, in recent years. So the resolution framework uh, will enable us to resolve banks quickly and safely uh, without a negative impact on financial stability and without reaching for the taxpayers' pockets. Uh, these mechanisms in the euro area are for the countries which share the euro as their currency. Uh, uh, they are open to any other EU countries which wish to join the system, uh, and uh, they are mechanisms which will apply the same common set of rules uh, as all the other member states of the European Union. So this is not a separate set of uh, uh, laws as regards substantive uh, supervision requirements or resolution arrangements. Those are the same for all 28 countries, but the Eurozone will have its own uh, mechanisms and inst institutional framework uh, uh, on a more tightly integrated basis. This sends a message, I hope, to the world about the solidity of the Eurozone and of the wider European Union. Uh, this will uh, the supervision system will uh, commence uh, once there has been an objective assessment of the quality of banking assessments across the whole of the uh, euro area banks. Uh, that assessment is underway at the moment. But capitalization of banks is not the only thing uh, we have been working on. Uh, we have carried out wide-ranging reforms of financial rules to make the sector stronger, more secure, uh, and more future-proof. We have improved supervisory systems, uh, we have, I think, improved uh, bankers' incentives so that they avoid excessive risk. Uh, we have put in place proper oversight of credit rating agencies, uh, better regulation, uh, and I hope leading to a, uh, a better run and more competitive uh, auditing sector. Uh, new rules uh, to improve how benchmarks are operated and regulated. Uh, and we are busy now uh, on shadow banking uh, and on uh, the structure of the banking sector. We are doing this under our system in a sequence uh, of uh, uh, different pieces of legislation, unlike uh, the one uh, big uh, act of Congress that you have in Dodd-Frank, 
uh, uh, we have different techniques and different legal and constitutional structures, of course, but uh, I think we end up uh, in uh, very similar places. So we've come a long way uh, in reforming how banks are regulated and supervised, uh, but as I said, there remains the big issue of the way in which banks are structured. We're working on a common framework for structural reform following the report uh, of a committee uh, led by the governor of the Bank of Finland, uh, Eki Likanen, uh, and the commission will issue a proposal on this uh, in the next few weeks. We know that banking reforms uh, enacted in jurisdictions across the world are complex. Uh, they have necessarily been far-reaching, uh, and we know that they can potentially cause friction for cross-border firms and transactions. We therefore have to be more, more coordinated, better coordinated in our efforts uh, to implement these rules. As I said, we are working closely with our American partners, uh, but uh, there is uh, a lot more we can do. Let me take the example of over-the-counter derivatives. Uh, the European Commission and the CFTC reached agreement in July on how to approach cross-border derivatives, trillions of dollars uh, uh, worth of business. Uh, we called our document the common path forward because we know that there is still uh, 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 work to do. It was a big step, uh, but derivatives are complex and there are still problems in making uh, this agreement uh, uh, stick and work properly. We need to find a solution on how to deal with different CCP margin requirements, uh, and uh, we need uh, to uh, obtain relief for EU venues from uh, US swap execution facility rules. Just last week, Commissioner Barnier wrote to CFTC Chair Gary Gensler to press for this relief. Uh, this is because our own rules governing trading platforms, uh, we call it in the European jargon MIFID, uh, will uh, come on stream in the coming months. Uh, and the last thing we need is duplication of slightly uh, different rules. Uh, we calculate that this uh, market is worth uh, $633 trillion, uh, and uh, it needs to be regulated, it needs to be supervised, it needs to be transparent, it does not need to be unduly disrupted. We uh, said in our agreement between the Commission and the CFTC that we would work to defer to each other's systems if they produce uh, similar outcomes, uh, and uh, globally the leaders of the G20 countries uh, agreed in St. Petersburg recently uh, that, uh, and I quote, we are committed to fully realizing the benefits of an open, integrated, and resilient global financial system. To this end, we will continue to take necessary actions in each of our jurisdictions to fully implement the agreed reforms in a consistent and non-discriminatory way. We will enhance cooperation and information sharing. It's time to put uh, those fine words uh, into action. Uh, and the way to do that is to provide for reliance, mutual reliance, uh, uh, between jurisdictions whose rules and systems uh, produce comparable outcomes. This is not about deregulating. Uh, it's not about letting financial markets off the hook. Both the EU and the US now have uh, robust rules in place. Uh, we worked closely together to get them recognized internationally and then onto our statute books. We now have to work closely together in implementing them and recognize each other's rules. What you call swap dealers, major swap participants, or swap execution facilities should be allowed to comply with US requirements by virtue of complying with EU requirements and vice versa. Now, this area of OTC derivatives is only one, uh, uh, but it was one in which after uh, months of uh, difficult discussions, uh, uh, we were able to find uh, agreement on. Uh, it led to uncertainty in the market, uh, and uh, it was finally concluded at the 11th hour uh, with uh, deadlines looming. This is not the best way to conduct international discussions uh, between closely related partners uh, in such uh, important and sensitive areas. That is why we believe that we need a platform and an accountable process uh, to agree coherent financial services rules and to bring about consistent implementation. In this respect, the TTIP is an opportunity uh, which should not be missed. 
I look forward to decisive progress in the second round of negotiations, which should have been taking place now, of course, uh, and, uh, but have been postponed for the reasons of which we're all aware, uh, and uh, uh, we will get back to them uh, very soon, I hope. Now, Europeans and Americans talk a lot. Frequently, uh, in the context of our financial markets regulatory dialogue, in international discussions, day-to-day -day emails and phone calls. I'm here regularly, Michel Barnier was here. Uh, many of you uh, 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 visit us in Brussels, the US officials do. Uh, there is no shortage of dialogue. What we believe we do need is a better framework uh, for uh, that dialogue and that the TTIP uh, provides uh, that framework. It would help strengthen cooperation between regulators and supervisors and provide the best platform for mutual reliance. It would lead to, we hope, a results-orientated approach, uh, avoiding regulatory barriers of the kind that can unnecessarily damage the ways market function. This would in turn lead to better management of prudential risks uh, and uh, could help us avoid excessive regulatory complexity uh, and uh, uh, we uh, will, I think, if we achieve all that, uh, 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 be making a considerable uh, uh, contribution both to the US and the EU, uh, but also uh, for market players uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Now, the first round of the TTIP negotiations held here in Washington in July uh, gave us an opportunity for some initial, some initial exchanges and presentations of ideas. Uh, and uh, the second round, as I said, as soon as we can get it started, uh, will give us uh, another opportunity uh, to uh, go into these subjects in more detail. We should be minimizing differences, but identifying them where they do exist, uh, respecting each other's regulatory regimes and legal traditions. Where differences cannot be removed, and they inevitably uh, uh, will not all be, uh, we should look for an outcome-based approach, creating mechanisms based on equivalence or what you call substituted compliance, uh, it would help transatlantic trade to flourish safely. And it sends a strong message to the rest of the world about the quality of our rules and our cooperation in enforcing them. The discussions will not be easy. I'm aware of the debates uh, raging in this city, but I do hope that the United States will be convinced that this is an opportunity uh, to engage with us on financial regulation, uh, which uh, will not come again in this form uh, for some time. Regulators should lead uh, the exercise on both sides of the Atlantic, making sure that the specificities of the financial sector are properly taken into account. Trade negotiators, for their part, have to understand, but I'm certain that they do, by the way, that issues related to the uh, stability of financial markets are sensitive for the economy as a whole, uh, so that the risks of uh, including financial services in the TTIP are limited. I've had the personal experience of negotiating the financial part of the uh, European Union's, uh, I think, soon to be concluded uh, uh, free trade agreement with Canada, uh, and uh, I find the interplay between the uh, trade negotiators and the financial people extremely uh, encouraging, and if we and the Canadians can do it, there's no reason why uh, the Americans should not be able to do it either. We have a lot in common. We have strong support from our business communities and from our financial sectors, uh, and uh, we should get support also from wider civil society. The objective is to make regulatory reform effective. We've spent the last five years in Basel, in all sorts of places around the world, uh, crafting international commitments, standards, uh, a huge American contribution to that, considerable European contribution to that, but these are not rule-making bodies. There is no world finance organization. When it comes down to it, the actual rules are made in each domestic jurisdiction, democratically by parliaments and ministers, uh, and uh, that's what we're doing now. And the ultimate rule-making, even at uh, uh, a further subordinate level, uh, agencies, authorities on our side of the Atlantic. That's what has to work together. It's an extremely complicated machine, uh, but uh, getting 99% right is not good enough because the 1% that we don't get right can cause enormous friction uh, uh, and lead to uh, the undermining of the purpose for which we are doing this. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
uh, the EU and the US uh, have put in place, are still putting in place, robust regulatory frameworks. We are world leaders in setting standards in this field. Uh, we have a strong interest in making transatlantic uh, financial markets work properly and work better. We have a very good history of cooperation, and we share an ambition for a safer, more stable, more productive financial sector on both sides of the Atlantic. All we have to do now is make it happen. Thank you. I know that uh, the audience will probably have a, a good number of questions, but uh, certainly given the scope of your remarks, uh, covering everything from uh, what's happening uh, with regards to the banking union to uh, uh, issues involving cross-border uh, uh, swaps and all. But I think I'll start off with short-term questions uh, with regards to the banking union. Uh, in the FT and in another press, there's been some concern or at least questions asked with regards to timing and in particular the transition to the banking union. Uh, questions relating to the backstop provided uh, for European banks as the European banking union is ultimately established. How do you go about not only uh, creating a credible uh, stress testing system, but obviously uh, the degree to which one relies on other kinds of mechanisms, everything from the ESM uh, to national regulatory authorities uh, with regards to the recapitalization of those banks. And there's uh, some disagreement between the EU member states as to exactly um, how that process should play forward as one transitions to a banking union. Um, uh, I'd be very curious to get your thoughts on the immediate term as, as one builds up capacity uh, for banking regulation. Thank you. Well. Um, there is no doubt that this is legally and politically very complex. Uh, and uh, we are trying to do it fast and we're trying to do it uh, well. Uh, and uh, we need to build uh, a consensus uh, among member states, among members of the European Parliament. Uh, and uh, we're doing that. Uh, you all know, I'm not going to hide it from, you all know the complexities of European politics, 28 countries, everybody has an election, uh, fortunately. Uh, most of the time there's an election on somewhere. We're even having big elections of our own, Europe-wide, the next May. Uh, and uh, that means that in the complexities of the European constitutional framework, the national constitutional frameworks, uh, uh, these are very delicate matters. These are matters... Uh, uh, involving uh, uh, money, uh, power, uh, the uh, empowerment of institutions or even sub-institutional uh, uh, bodies. The FT story today is about uh, the constitutional question, small c, because like my own country, the European Union doesn't have a document called the Constitution, but it has one. Uh, uh, it has all the constitutional rules that you would you could write down. We did try to once, but it, uh, 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 it failed to, to get uh, popular uh, uh, consent in, in, uh, in various countries, as you know. But we have constitutional rules, for example, that we cannot empower agencies uh, to make discretionary policy judgments. So the question, and that's today's FT story, the question uh, where to strike the balance between what the EU institutions, in this case the Commission, uh, uh, may have to do and what a body created by legislation may have to do is a delicate one uh, and uh, the council legal advice, council legal service advice says that we should justify this argument, that argument a little better, we'll do that. It's not dramatic uh, and it's certainly not as some lurid headlines would have it uh, uh, Ill illegal. Um, so we have all those problems. Uh, and we have, assuming that everybody could agree what to do, we have to come to Chris's question, we have the transition. This will take time uh, to put in place, and where the fund uh, uh, is involved will take time to uh, find the finance. What happens in between? Well, of course, we all hope that nothing would go wrong, uh, and therefore we'll not need all this, but it would be foolish uh, 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 to, uh, to rely on that uh, hope. Uh, so... Uh, we are doing a number of things. Uh, we have uh, stress tests. Uh, by the way, a lot of bewildering uh, and slightly different terminology is used. We have stress tests and we have uh, uh, asset quality review, also known as, in fact, more properly known as balance sheet assessment. 
and the um, uh, stress tests of the future. Stress tests are where you uh, uh, look at certain hypotheses uh, and see whether a bank uh, can withstand those hypotheses uh, uh, given its current, uh, uh, its current standing. Uh, the asset quality review, the balance sheet assessment is very different. That is the European Central Bank uh, looking uh, uh, as forensically uh, uh, as possible at the real uh, uh, situation of the banks which it is going to supervise. Uh, and we all know about capital, uh, 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 and, and that the capital ratios are neat percentages, uh, uh, where uh, the detail gets diabolical, of course, is uh, do we all mean the same thing uh, about the quality of assets? Uh, and is everybody uh, revealing all that they should be revealing about the quality of their assets? There is still a doubt about that, uh, and the European Central Bank is going to put that doubt to rest by uh, a, a very thorough analysis of uh, the uh, balance sheets, particularly on the asset side, of uh, the uh, banks of uh, the euro area. The stress test, by the way, will continue to be done for the whole of the EU by the European Banking Authority. Now, the big question is what happens if the balance sheets are not all they're cracked up to be? Uh, what happens if there is a gap uh, and there is a need for further capitalization? Where's the money going to come from? Uh, and uh, what rules govern the uh, provision of that money until this system is fully up and running in its steady state? A number of answers to that. First of all, capital can be raised. Uh, banks have been raising a lot of capital in Europe uh, in the normal market ways in which uh, capital can be raised. It's not easy, uh, but it is possible. Secondly, we have, fortunately, uh, and have had, by the way, since the 1950s, something called the state aid rules, uh, which are the closest we get today to having a resolution system and a common European framework for uh, uh, this sector. The state aid rules are part of competition policy. You don't really have it in the US as part of your antitrust policy, but we've had it from the very beginning. And under the state aid rules, simply the commission, which is the authority for these purposes, has to decide whether uh, injection of public funds is justified in the circumstance of the case, and this applies to all sectors of industry, uh, and uh, what is the, uh, uh, if the aid is given for the purpose of restructuring or rescuing uh, a company or a bank, uh, what is the uh, corresponding restructuring effort being made by the, uh, by the company or the bank? And that has led in the banking sector to all sorts of conditional approvals of the granting of state aid, often the selling of assets. Why? It's because this is a branch of competition policy, because it is unfair. It gives a, an unfair competitive advantage to a company receiving state aid over uh, its competitors who do not. Uh, and therefore, they have to make an effort uh, to restructure themselves, uh, particularly if the aid is designed as uh, uh, aid to the restructuring of the company concern. That is why uh, lots of European banks are in the process of selling off uh, branch networks, uh, other assets, some uh, assets over here, by the way, uh, in order to uh, restore as much as possible a level playing field between themselves uh, and uh, uh, unaided banks. So we have that. We have specific rules set out in a set of guidelines on state aid uh, to the uh, banking sector, which include bail-in rules, include some of the rules which you will find in uh, the resolution legislation. So if uh, uh, resorting to capital markets uh, turns out not to be enough uh, and uh, a state uh, steps in, then uh, the state aid rules will apply. And the ESM, would that also be a potential source of capital or is this, uh, has the commission signed on to that position? Uh, we have not signed on to that position. Uh, it could potentially play a role, uh, but that, that has not been decided. Okay. Well, when, it, when one thinks about uh, uh, rulemaking more generally, uh, certainly you have the comparatively lower hanging fruit of the SSM as compared to the single resolution mechanism. But just from an American perspective, once you have an SSM in place, 
Uh, and once you do have a more centralized European authority for uh, banking supervision, uh, there are questions that obviously are going to arise here. Uh, we, I think, for the large part, welcome that. There are questions as to what then uh, this means for transatlantic regulatory coordination and cooperation. Does the centralization of regulatory authority under the SSM uh, change uh, in any way uh, the nature of transatlantic coordination? Does it have any particular implications for U.S. Uh, firms operating uh, in Europe, if not in the immediate term, then in the, media, in the medium to longer term? Um, uh, uh, besides, obviously, stabilizing the financial sy system, are there any other um, uh, stakes, regulatory stakes, uh, for a U.S. audience uh, as Europe goes about restructuring its banking system? Yes, I mean, I think people uh, are already used to the idea of dealing with the European Central Bank as a central bank. Uh, it has established itself uh, in the worst possible environment, uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle of a crisis, as a highly respected central bank all over the world. And I have no doubt it will establish itself very quickly as a respected and competent uh, supervisory authority. Uh, we have created, but I mean, frankly, your system is no simpler when you look at the details, but we, we are creating a complicated system. Uh, uh, we never actually abolish anything. We seem to add something on top. So it's not as though suddenly you have the European... We know nothing about that here. I, I, I make no comment. <laughs> uh, we have not created a European supervisor and abolished all the national supervisors. National supervisors will remain uh, in existence uh, with a slightly different role, but the ECB will be uh, the key supervisory authorities uh, for uh, big European banks and potentially whenever it... Uh, judges it necessary to do so for all uh, banks uh, in the Eurozone. Things to watch for, well, because Europe is a complicated place, the Eurozone is not the whole of the European Union. Uh, and there happens to be a rather big country with a big financial center, which is outside uh, the Eurozone, but in the European Union, the United Kingdom. So those of you, and many of you will be doing this, those of you uh, uh, dealing with uh, London regularly, will still find London in pretty much the same shape as it is today. Uh, but uh, in the wider European context, uh, we will have to bed down the banking union within the wider European Union, all of which is supposed to be, is a single market. A single market with all its imperfections, but a growingly, uh, increasingly perfect single market. Uh, and uh, the way in which relationships settle down between the Bank of England and the European Central Bank, uh, between the uh, resolution authorities of the non-Euro countries and the new resolution system we will be creating for the Euro countries will be important, complicated, difficult to, uh, 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 to watch, but needing to be watched. The banking union is designed to be able to grow. Uh, it starts with the 18 uh, members of the Eurozone, but uh, I expect that other non-Euro countries will join it. Why do I say that? Well, simply without giving the, uh, any secrets away, having been involved in all the negotiations, what I saw was that the non-Euro countries, uh, with one or two exceptions, uh, uh, negotiated very hard for a system which they would feel comfortable in joining uh, if and when they choose to do so. Uh, I don't know when they will, uh, but uh, frankly, I think some of them will in the medium term, and you will gradually see the banking union extending uh, to most of continental Europe. Uh, I know that there are a good number of uh, questions given the scope of, of, of your remarks, but I'll, I'll just ask one last question with regard to the trade, uh, uh, particularly with regards to financial services. Uh, and your discussions to which you can share with us uh, with the Canadians. Uh, w to the extent to which there is some consideration of a financial services provision, uh, do you have any thoughts as to what the, the, the substance of that kind of uh, agreement would, would entail? Um, certainly there's a lot of uh, concern uh, in the United States about whether or not 
a trade agreement would end up watering down prudential rules. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a lot of talk about creating, as you had mentioned, a, a framework uh, and a process-driven uh, approach towards uh, getting the two sides a little bit closer together uh, on all of the myriad uh, issues. Um, uh, I don't know if you hadn't had uh, any thoughts either as to how things are playing out in Canada or just more generally as to what a financial services chapter would look like. I think it would be useful uh, for an American audience to hear. Well, it's a bit premature to talk about what a chapter would look like, but there is absolutely no doubt that nobody wants to water down prudential rules. Uh, that would be the starting point uh, for us and for the Americans, no doubt, in any negotiation that really starts getting serious. Uh, prudential rules are there to be uh, protected and applied, not to be undermined. Uh, and it is in order to apply them properly that we think international cooperation is necessary. Uh, because the prudential rules that you have and we have often apply to the same things and the same people. Uh, and if we want that system to work uh, properly and not to fragment uh, the world's uh, financial capital markets uh, 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 any more than the crisis has already brought about, uh, our rules and your rules have to work together. But they should not be in any way uh, watered down uh, or limited. Uh, that was very much the outlook uh, that we had and shared immediately with our Canadian friends. And as I said, nobody should fear from what I've seen that the trade people uh, have a different view. There is, there is deference there as well, full respect uh, for financial services regulation being different from regulation of agricultural trade or, or industrial trade. Uh, prudential rules are, are essential. Uh, the crisis has taught us that we didn't have the right ones in place. We've spent the last five years uh, improving them. Uh, we now have to apply them, but we have to apply them internationally because fortunately, uh, globalization and integration of markets, they may have taken a knock, but they have not been reversed. They're still there. Absolutely. Uh, any questions, uh, please feel free to ask and to identify, well, Doug Elliott, please. <laughs> You, uh, you correctly pointed out the importance of reducing the linkage between banks and their sovereigns. Uh, two questions about that. One, unless the single resolution authority has funding on a common basis across the union, there still will be a significant linkage between national sovereigns, creditworthiness, and the creditworthiness of the banks that they support. Uh, the Germans and some others have been pushing back strongly against that sort of mutualization. Be interested in your thoughts on that. And secondly, does the commission support having a risk weighting above zero on sovereign debt uh, or other ways of reducing the concentration of banks' investments in the uh, credit of their sovereign? Thank you. Uh, well, we certainly believe there needs to be a single resolution fund. That's what we've proposed. Uh, is there uh, an argument about it? Of course. Uh, mutualization uh, can very easily uh, be understood or misunderstood as the strong paying for the weak and the taxpayers of one paying for the other, and that raises political problems. We have just started the process of negotiating this legislation. Uh, a lot of it's I think unfortunately, but okay, we're democracies uh, in the public. Every document seems to leak within uh, hours. Uh, and uh, that, so you can all see what's going on. Uh, we want a single resolution fund. So do a lot of countries. Some are, uh, remain to be persuaded. Uh, we have good arguments. Uh, you presented uh, uh, the main argument yourself. Uh, if you're serious about breaking the link between the sovereigns and the banks, uh, that's the obvious way to do it. Uh, so we'll see. Um, there are uh, uh, already compromise ideas being floated. Uh, we are not yet in the business of uh, uh, looking for uh, uh, compromises. We are still trying to persuade uh, uh, the governments and uh, parliamentarians that we have taken the right approach and this is what uh, Europe needs. Uh, and this is uh, the best way to, to achieve the goal and, by the way, uh, to fulfill uh, the promises that the European Council, so the big, big bosses, 
uh, heads of state and government have made in, uh, uh, in successive summits. Uh, I'm not, I don't want to get drawn into risk weighting uh, for sovereign debt. It's a controversial issue. Uh, we have not taken a public position on it yet. Another question. So, sorry. You, uh, you can get the microphone uh, for him, and, and feel free to identify uh, yourself. You mentioned both legal regulatory arbitrage and audit reform, and it would be very helpful to have your views on what is going to come out <laughs> of the audit reform package in your best guess, and to the extent you can comment, and how it affects your views of the former, of uh, legal arbitrage. Well, in an ideal world, uh, the main jurisdictions would have very similar rules and there would be uh, very little uh, regulatory arbitrage. Uh, of course, we don't live in that ideal world uh, and uh, therefore uh, we have to work together, as I said, to make sure that slightly different rules uh, work as harmoniously and seamlessly together as, uh, as we can make it. Audit reform is a, is a good example. Uh, we have uh, a, uh, a piece of legislation going through our system at the moment, uh, which is pretty close now to the end of the tunnel in the sense that last Friday, I think it was, uh, uh, we, uh, and I don't know whether this is leaked actually, if there were, I'm not sure how much I can say, but uh, we can now see in discussions with our member states uh, a, uh, a landing zone uh, where uh, everybody uh, can come together. We now have to take that back to the European Parliament uh, uh, and reconcile, and this is the whole system we have, reconcile the consensus in the Council of Ministers with the emerging consensus in the European Parliament. All of that leads me to believe that there will be legislation uh, in uh, the coming months. I hope by the end of the year. Now, uh, for those who don't follow this, the big controversial issues are uh, should there be mandatory rotation uh, for audit firms uh, and uh, should audit firms uh, be allowed to provide non-audit services to the uh, clients uh, whose books they're auditing as well. And on both of those big issues, we are, uh, as I said, approaching uh, landing, uh, because uh, it comes down to figures, of course, uh, there is a uh, figure, but I'm not at liberty to reveal it, uh, a, a number of years after which uh, rotation uh, has to happen. And uh, there will be a list of activities which uh, auditors for large companies, and there's a threshold, uh, should not be allowed to provide uh, to uh, clients uh, they are auditing at the same time in order to uh, uh, reduce, if not uh, eliminate altogether, uh, potential conflicts of interest. Uh, we are also keen, third element, to uh, encourage more competition in this sector, which is a, a four-firm oligopoly worldwide, by the way. Uh, and uh, uh, that's not to say there are not other players, but they are smaller in size, and uh, we hope that the rotation system will not simply be uh, among the big four, but will give uh, competitive opportunities to uh, other firms as well. Uh, Fran Burwell. Jonathan, if I could ask a more political question. Uh, you have done an enormous amount, the EU has done an enormous amount of rules and legislation over the last five years, as you pointed out, and you still have a pretty big agenda going forward. You mentioned the hope that you would get the banking resolution done by the time the parliament goes out for election. How confident are you that we will continue to see when the EU sort of reconvenes in October next fall with new commissioners and a new parliament, etc., that this type of uh, activity will move forward, or are you kind of racing toward the end uh, of this parliament, hoping that you can get all the major work done by then? I understand that technically legislation can go over to the next parliament, but we are also facing an, uh, a moment when most political observers of the EU would recommend, would 
reckon that the next parliament will be somewhat more Eurosceptic and perhaps less cooperative. Uh, perhaps though, financial regulation doesn't play into that equation at all. So I'm wondering about your assessment. Well, this is, uh, uh, your crystal ball is as good as mine. Uh, the people uh, will elect, peoples will elect uh, a new parliament. Uh, and then there will be new presidents and commissioners and directors general uh, down the food chain. Uh, and uh, uh, will there be uh, differences of approach? I'm sure there will. Uh, have we passed a high watermark of regulation? Probably is my guess, but it's only a guess. Uh, we have uh, had five years of intense activity internationally, domestically. There are still big agenda items out there, structure, you know, your Volcker rule, our Lee Cannon follow-up, whatever it is, uh, is big. Shadow banking is still big. There are still things to do. Our single market is far from perfect. But I wouldn't be surprised, but that's as far as I can go, I think, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the next five years were uh, less devoted to uh, big regulatory initiatives uh, as opposed to uh, the equally important work of implementing all of this, making sure it works, doing the international stuff that we're talking about this morning. Now, that assumes no uh, unexpected crisis that we haven't thought of, uh, uh, that assumes the continuation of a broad political consensus. But I mean, looking around Europe, governments of left and right, uh, center left, center right, uh, are part of that consensus. Uh, looking around the world, there's an international consensus. Uh, the Eurosceptics you refer to, uh, fr frankly, this is not their big ticket item. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, uh, that's not their big selling point to their electors. Uh, they may think that this should all be left to individual countries and not done uh, in Brussels, but it's international. It's pretty hard to see, frankly, how it could be done by 28 individual jurisdictions. Uh, so, yes, there will, and, they, and I imagine uh, the Eurosceptics will not be the biggest party in the European Parliament, but that's up to my brothers and sisters who will vote. Uh, uh, so we'll see. So my best guess is that the broad consensus will continue uh, and that we are already in a shift from uh, massive regulatory endeavor to, uh, to implementation. Okay, we'll just take one, uh, well, we'll just take maybe a <laughs> couple questions. Did I say something provocative? <laughs> no, let's, let's, let's take maybe three more questions, but at the same time, and you can selectively choose. Yeah, yes, please. My name is Olga Reyes. I am an independent consultant, but I was formerly the ambassador of Uruguay to the Organization of American States. And I will put you a more general question. Uh, recently, the Secretary General of NATO mentioned uh, the TTIP as an economic NATO, and he said the importance of the security together with the economy, saying that the Article 2 of NATO refers that economic collaboration among states is a way to avoid conflicts. So my question is, what do you believe about that? And also, would the postponing of the second round complicate the timetable of completing the TTIP by 2014? Great question. We'll take another and just a note that our own ambassador, Gray, has also written a very well-known uh, article calling forth for an economic NATO. Please. Hi, this is Nick Perik from the State Department. Um, two questions. Um, what is the status of the financial transaction tax, especially in lieu of the legal opinion from the council's body? And number two, um, um, Angela Merkel uh, pre-election uh, seemed, uh, at least in the press, to side with uh, Prime Minister Cameron um, in statements saying that uh, regulatory authority needs to be clawed back from the EC back to nation states, member states. Um, what might that look like uh, going forward, if you can speculate on that? Thank you. Okay, and one more question from this side for, for balance. 
Uh, good morning, Jonathan. Marjorie Chorlins with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We led a delegation of businesses to Brussels last week to meet with the lead negotiators, including those in your own uh, directorate. And it was clear from that meeting that there is broad consensus between the European negotiators and the business community on the importance of including financial services regulation in the agreement. We know where the stumbling blocks are. We know where the, the reluctant players are. Uh, and my question to you is, uh, how do you see it ultimately playing out? What steps do you feel uh, the commission can take to encourage uh, the right outcome? Uh, and you know, obviously the business community has been doing its part to encourage Treasury and others to engage. But, but I'm interested in your take, recognizing it is a bit of crystal balling on how this, uh, how this might work out. Lots of easy questions for you. <laughs> Uh, economic NATO, well, I'm not a specialist on NATO, and there are very distinguished ones in the audience. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, may be, it may be a helpful analogy in, in understanding where we're going. Uh, it may help us uh, in, uh, in, I hope, sustainably peaceful times to think about uh, other areas where we are interdependent and have to work together. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, the geographical coverage is different. These are different areas, of course, but if it, if it helps people to think about it, I, I have no problem with the idea. I uh, shamefully admit I've not read Boyden's article, but will rush to do so uh, afterwards. It's also on the Atlantic Council website. Okay, I will look on the website. Um, but uh, uh, it's, uh, there's no underestimating the importance of uh, uh, financial uh, uh, problems and solutions to us all in today's world. We live in an independent world. Uh, that was the, the insight of NATO, of course, as well. Uh, and that's, I mean, I'll come to the last question uh, later, but it, 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 it informs that as well. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have to get this right. The consequences of failure are, are too uh, awful to, to contemplate. The delay in the TTIP talks, well, you know, how long is a piece of string? How long is a shutdown? I, uh, we don't do this sort of thing. <laughs> so I, 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 defer to, I defer to my American friends on that. If we're talking about, instead of last Monday, the meeting's going to be next Monday or the Monday after, the delay is uh, uh, minimal. Uh, and, and the commitment to, to the process is still uh, very strong. If this goes on for a long time, well, uh, we're all uh, in a different situation. Uh, but my hope is that those talks will start again as soon as the uh, US officials are back at their desks. Uh, and uh, in the, uh, you know, the grander scheme of things, missing a few days here or there uh, doesn't matter very much and perhaps will actually galvanize them into uh, uh, more uh, rapid action than, than would otherwise be the case. Uh, FTT, well, uh, uh, not my responsibility. Uh, it's another department. No, it's not a cop-out. So I, I don't follow this on a daily basis. Uh, there are, once again, massive legal complications, massive political complexities. Uh, 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 but the commitment to uh, an FTT uh, among the countries uh, uh, which uh, will be part of the enhanced cooperation remains very strong. The details are still being worked out. Uh, it's very controversial uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, the scope of it uh, in its design is one of the most controversial. We'll see. There will be, uh, my guess is there will be an FTT, uh, not necessarily the one in exactly the same shape as the commission uh, initially proposed. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, ah, uh, Ms. Merkel and Mr. Cameron. Uh, well, uh, Nobody quite knows, uh, uh, in fact, nobody knows the detail of what uh, a uh, clawback of regulatory authority, your words, and I don't think the Chancellor's exactly, not mine, would mean. Uh, there is a growing sense in, to simplify Northern Europe, uh, which encompasses the Nordic countries, uh, uh, stricto sensu, the Netherlands, uh, Germany to a certain extent, and, but in a different league, the United Kingdom, that uh, Brussels should concentrate on uh, certain essential things and uh, should not seek to regulate less important things. And the Commission 
recognizes that and the commission uh, issued a, uh, I can't remember what it was legally, a communication I think last week uh, on an analysis we made of all of our pending proposals to see what exactly uh, uh, needed to remain on the table and what could be dropped. And a number of things have been dropped. It's called the REFIT exercise, which stands for something. Can you remember what it stands for? It's one of these acronyms which uh, uh, means something as well as an acronym. Anyway, REFIT exercise. Uh, looking again, there is a, uh, there is a growing feeling uh, that uh, uh, the European institutions need to concentrate on uh, top priority matters uh, and uh, concentrate less on or even do less of some other things. All that said, uh, between all of those countries, the ones I've mentioned, and I guess between Chancellor Merkel and Prime Minister Cameron, there are uh, fairly uh, large differences insofar as one can discern them of uh, uh, positions on matters of detail. A single market, any market needs regulation, unless you're an absolute, I mean, maybe people in this country actually, but a total libertarian, and you don't want any market rules at all, there have to be market rules. If you have a single market, that means Brussels rules. Uh, uh, but uh, the good thing about Brussels rules is but subject to what I said earlier about never taking anything away but adding on, one Brussels rule should replace 28 national rules. That's how it should work. Um, so uh, some of the detailed rules uh, applicable to, I don't know, standardization of products and so on, are necessary simply because you need those rules in a, uh, uh, in a market, and if you have a big market, you need big market-wide rules. So I don't know, but the coming years are going to tell us, of course, I don't know exactly what people want regulated less. Uh, we are, uh, the Netherlands, Dutch government has produced a list. The British government has not produced a list. Uh, we assume that in the run-up to the British general election, a, a possible British referendum, uh, there will be demands, demands, requests, requirements, call them what you want, uh, which will form the basis of some sort of renegotiation, settlement, referendum, uh, who knows. The British are not alone, but they may be outliers in the, uh, uh, the extent of what they want. But this is guesswork at the moment. Uh, some people, but th this is where it gets very controversial, some people say, for example, the, the, the European Union should not regulate social matters. Uh, uh, social matters, again, subject to proper definition of what social matters are, should be left to the member states uh, uh, and uh, uh, Brussels should not intervene. We'll see. There will be a lot of opposition to that uh, and eventually there will have to be a consensus to keep the European Union going. If there's going to be a new settlement, whether or not uh, in the form of a new treaty, then uh, 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 people will have to start arguing in detail about uh, precisely what they want. Okay, great. Uh, uh, no, no, I didn't finish, sorry. Oh, that's right. That's how, right. Will, how will TTIP play out? Well, who knows? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we, we will, we will uh, I think we have good arguments for including it. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we, we all have to make the right arguments. We're not, this is not uh, a league of uh, weak, feckless, uh, under-regulating foreigners and Wall Street uh, uh, to, to undo the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, uh, th we're not playing that game. I hope Wall Street is not playing that game. Uh, uh, and, but I mean, we have to persuade our American interlocutors, and more broadly, no doubt, US public opinion, uh, that this is in their interest as well as ours. Uh, so we have to keep arguing, doing the sort of things I'm doing here this morning, uh, uh, explaining what we're doing, why we're doing it, why we think it is no less good than what you have been doing differently, uh, and that we need to, to make this work together. Uh, uh, if we are serious about uh, uh, improving trade between us, uh, it is no longer really about coal and steel. Uh, it is about the digital economy and it's about the services economy. Uh, and those are regulated uh, in different ways uh, and it is regulation which determines market access. We don't have tariffs 
on uh, banks or on computer downloads. Uh, we have other things. This is the modern, uh, the way modern trade is done. It's the modern economy. So if we're serious about this, this is a, a maturing process. Uh, it used to be the GATT, it used to be this, it used to be that. Now we are uh, uh, in the business of improving trade uh, in uh, uh, very important features of the modern economy. Okay, uh, this has been an extraordinarily wide-ranging and, and very useful uh, conversation, and we really appreciate you uh, making the time to, to, to talk to us today. I think we all owe uh, Jonathan Fall an applause for making it out.